Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Podcast Daily. It is Monday. It is a new week of Ohio State coverage, and we are all ready for it. Uh, with Jeremy Birmingham, Bill Landis, and myself, Austin Ward, we are going to primarily look back on what we learned uh, and what we didn't learn from Ohio State football last week after the full Coaches Media Day. As we're within uh, about a month now until spring camp opens. But before we do that, there was a rivalry basketball game on Sunday, and the free fall for the Buckeyes just absolutely – there's no end in sight. Berm, you were not part of our previous conversation where Bill and I touched on just about everything that we could on the current state of that uh, team and Chris Holtman's status moving forward. When You, more than anybody, seem to want to be invested in this program, but that's got to be kind of hard right now. What are you making of what's happening here? Uh, I mean, it just seems like a team that doesn't have any real sense of what it means to play team basketball. And I think in the Big Ten, more than any league around the country, if you're not willing to pass the ball and move without the ball, then things get stagnant. There, there's Their defenses in the Big Ten are too good and allowed to be too physical to try to play hero ball, and that's just what Ohio State does. On Sunday, you know, we watched as the Buckeyes battled. I mean, that's what they always do. They always fight, and that's that's a testament to Chris Holtman and, and what they teach and coach. But at some point, the fight isn't enough if you're not playing team basketball. And it, we watch as, as Bryce Sensabaugh, he's hitting sort of this wall. He's fouled out two games in a row. Bruce Thornton, who has struggled for the last month and a half to score points, put, has a career high on Sunday, but nobody else is there to help out. So uh, it, it's just very frustrating to watch a team that has veteran leadership. I don't care about 10 new guys. That That's part of college basketball now. There's three teams in the Big Ten that have more have double-digit new players. So it's not a, a unique problem to Ohio State. This is a problem that the veterans at Ohio State are just simply not leading the young guys, and and that is that is really, really disappointing when you have guys like Zed Key and Justice Suing who have been there as long as they have been. Yeah, the thing that's that's most disheartening, I think, if you're an Ohio State basketball fan, is that January was January. There were two and seven, I believe. Calendar flips to, to February. You think, okay, let's flush that. Let, let's try to stack some wins here, see if we can't scrape our way back into NCAA tournament contention. Starts with a home game against a Wisconsin team that's not particularly good and in the basement of the Big Ten just like you are, and you lose that one, and then you go on the road, and, and it's kind of flat again against Michigan. The, the start, I think, on, on the road against Michigan was better than it was against Wisconsin the other night, um, which I suppose is progress, but the result is the same, and the season continues to slip away, and they are uh, under 500 in February for the first time in like 20 years so since the jim o'brien era yep <laughs> it's very unusual and look we talked about the financial reasons why no change is expected uh with chris holtman or from gene smith but if you have to start the month of february with a vote of confidence from your athletic director that's a pretty bad sign there's no reason for anybody to want to go support this team down the stretch when that's already the period that we're in where gene smith is trying to spin this forward because of a contract extension that whether it was smart or not, whether it was a, a horrific mistake at the time or not, there's doesn't, it doesn't change that it exists. And I are like, well, he's the coach of the future. How is, I don't know how anybody is supposed to react to that when there's still five weeks of this. And there's really, as I said, there's no end in sight. I don't see how it can get any better. Uh, I'm a, beating a dead horse in that regard, but like, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm an optimist. I'm an eternal optimist in my heart. Oh yeah, um, that's right. I, I really do believe that with the makeup that you have of this team, with the core that you have of young players, with the recruiting class that's coming in next season, you have talent at a level Ohio State hasn't had just player player to player, probably since the 2010 2011 team, where you have guys that can just get things done. Especially next year when you add guys like Scotty Middleton, et cetera. Um, you should have Zed Key back. I think if there's a, if I'm just trying to find a silver lining here somewhere, and that's what I do, um, is that <laughs> Bryce Sensabaugh's recent struggles maybe in lead him to return next year when he could be a top 20 pick in the NBA draft. Probably won't happen, but uh, I think that's why you look at Holtman's, you know, next year and a half and say this is the this is the measuring stick, not this season. It's this season and next season. And if things are the same way next season, when you have eight very talented freshmen and sophomores and there's still no continuity and there's still no chemistry, then that seems to me like a much bigger issue. So I'm, I'm always willing to give a coach uh, a reprieve, um, especially considering just the way the big 10 is. And this is, you know, I think that's the frustrating part. This year's big 10 is not very, um, it's not top heavy. Like this is a, a good conference, but it's not what it's been the last handful of years. So 
you start the way Ohio State did and just fall off. On, uh, that is a problem, and I don't think there's any way to avoid calling it that. But Gene Smith also is not going to hyperreact, and and we know that. So it's kind of pointless to talk about it as a you know is he going to be fired thing. He did last spring. Yeah, but he shouldn't have then either. <laughs> I mean, it shouldn't have if you're going to give the extension. But he got the extension, so now you have to you have to ride it out. You have to let this season and next season play out before you make that sort of move. I think. Yeah, you dedicated yourself to that. So, and 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 again, I think Austin and I touched on this. If you look at it like sort of in, in a in a vacuum of just this year and next year, that's one thing. It's it's why is that allowed in year six and seven of a coaching tenure? I think is a different question. But I don't know. The one thing I, I will add because Austin, you said the thing about why would anyone want to support the team at this point? The crowd against Wisconsin was pretty good. Like I was I was surprised. Um, they were into that game the entire time. Part of that was probably they were all really mad at the officials in that game and got juiced <laughs> up when Chris Holtman got ejected. Um, yeah. But that 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 crowd like never backed off. Like they tried to will that team to a comeback win. Um, and the times I've been in the building, I, I know it doesn't have a reputation for being the best building. Uh, the crowds have been pretty good and invested and and clearly wanting to see the team play well. Um, how long that can persist when the losses keep stacking, we'll see. But they're at home for their next two, so I guess we'll find out. I think that's the benefit of having a young team is that your the fan bases or at least those in attendance who are the the more diehard basketball fans are willing to give a little bit more of a concession to the young guys as long as they see them efforting to win and, and that's something again we're it's not like you're watching a team that doesn't try they're just not very good now yeah. that that's a concern obviously but I I don't they are out there trying but what they're doing is just not working so again that comes back to Holtman and, and how he fixes it. Um, but I don't see anyone having like visible frustration or, or not enjoying themselves or not trying. Um, there's no, you know, Mark Lovings out there. So at, at this point I'm willing to accept, I'm willing, I'm willing to accept the hustle at least. And that's, you know, a big part of basketball. Mark Loving catching strays on the podcast daily. Didn't have that on my bingo card to start the week. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I mean, right? I mean, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I think everybody knows what you mean. It just we didn't know if anyone was going to say it out loud. But uh, that's that's probably enough. Uh, the rest of the show would be exactly the same things that I said uh, a week or two ago when Bill and I talked about the situation moving forward. So let's get back uh, to Ohio State football. Again, Wednesday was great. I uh, appreciate the time that every member of the full-time coaching staff gave us, plus Mark Pantoni and James Laurinaitis. Uh, but even in that two and a half hours, that doesn't mean that every question we have about Ohio State football can be fully answered. So, Bill, what are you still most curious about moving forward here into February and the start of Matt Drills and the final stretch of winter workouts? There are probably um, more pressing, like bigger picture questions. But as we've like sort of digested what we heard and started writing some stuff and getting some feedback from people on the on the message board uh, at OhioStateRivals.com, like I got a lot of questions about Ben Christman and how he sort of fits into the picture on the offensive line, and that was like just a name that didn't come up with Justin Fry. Um, and Justin Fry, I think, is not the kind of guy that's just going to mention names organically. I think you have to sort of press him about individuals. So I, I wouldn't read too much into that. But I am very curious about how a guy who seems like he's multi-positional i think can play guard probably probably can play tackle he has pretty good size um fits into the picture there where they have openings in the depth at, at, at all four of those those positions left tackle right tackle left guard right guard so um i'd like to lo learn a little more about the the progress he's made um because if the, the 2020 recruiting class or at least the guys that were still left over like i think you feel pretty good about where jacob james and, and certainly where josh fryer are but the rest of that class not so much and then you get into 2021 and it's like donovan jackson and then if there's like another like miss there and I, i'm not labeling him at ben christman a, a miss just yet but but I, I think you need that to be a hit for in order to feel really good about your depth so um he was like toward the top of the list of guys that i still find myself wondering about just just kind of how he fits into the puzzle after those interviews yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you're talking about a guy who was a top 100 player coming out of high school and um, from Ohio. Everyone wants to see him succeed, but we know the offensive line's a developmental position. Two years in the program generally is not long enough for a guy to make an impact unless they are a mm -hmm. Paris Johnson or a Luke Whippler. So I think it makes sense, though, that people are concerned about it because we, we're we waiting, I think, for people to see something out of Grant Tutant or, or Trey LaRue in the 2020 class, and you automatically just now leap ahead to the 22 class. And, and try to see, what, okay, what about Fitzpatrick? What about Shibola? But there's still Crispin there in the middle. Um, to me, if I, I'm going to go back to the 21 class as well, and it's really about Jordan Hancock and where he's at and how how 
because we couldn't talk about Davis and Igbenosin with uh, Tim Walton on Wednesday. I'm just curious exactly where they see these guys lining up. If this, are we going to go back to the Kerry Combs rotational thing where you think you have essentially three starters, or is it a situation where uh, Jordan Hancock is still not able to to push Denzel Burke uh, for that for the meaningful snaps, or, or who who do they see really filling in that role? Because there are a couple of guys like J.R. Brown and stuff who are more of that slot guy, um, and you wonder how they find time for all these guys. But um, Igben Osen and how he impacts Jordan Hancock, I think, is the one that really interests me the most because I would expect Jordan Hancock to be a starter uh, heading into spring, and at this case now it's a different competition. So I, I would have liked to get a little bit more clarity on that from Tim Walton. I felt the same way at safety, Berman. And maybe, maybe I'm just being, I don't know, too dumb about it or thinking too hard about it. I'm not sure which. Like I know that Sonny Styles needs to play. I know that Kai Stokes has the ability to play. I f- feel like Lathan Ransom can play any of the spots in the secondary potentially for Ohio State. So like it shouldn't be that hard because like Cam Martinez or Jahad Carter are going to play in the nickel. But I still just then you throw Josh Proctor in the mix. I still can't wrap my mind around okay, well, who are going to be the first three? And then how much is it experimentation? How much are different personnel groups? Like, what do you want to do if you're Perry Eliano and Jim Knowles trying to piece together that group? Because there's there's certainly enough talent. There's certainly enough versatility. There's experience uh, in multiple spots there. It's like, it would seem like that'd be a really encouraging situation for Ohio State. And I, and I think that they do feel that way. I just, I'm, I don't really know how they're going to line up and how consistently they would they would roll with the same three guys, and what is the best spot for Lathan Ransom to actually play moving forward? So, again, the answer could be much more obvious than I feel like it is. But I, I tried to ask both of those coaches about it, and it was like, well, you know, we can do whatever we want, and we're gonna we'll do seventy five percent of this and twenty five percent of that. And like, well, great, can you like actually tell me what the seventy five percent is and what <laughs> like because I I don't really feel like I have a good idea of what, and they don't have to decide right now which is the benefit that they have going into March and April. But I don't know. Maybe you guys feel like it's more clear cut than I have it in my own mind, but I just, I don't, I haven't got to that point yet. I I certainly don't think it's clear cut. And and I'm curious, Bill, if you think that based on the way last season finished defensively, if they go into spring with almost a, you know, be ready to wipe the deck clean and just, move guys around as opposed to saying, well, Lathan should play this spot because that's what he played last year. Cause clearly in the biggest games, the safety play wasn't very good. So how do you, do you go into this spring with a mindset of we're going to just completely reevaluate things or is it, I prefer to have him here, but uh, we'll see if somebody beats him out. I mean, I, I think I personally with all these parts returning and all these guys that are versatile and interchangeable, I probably would just clear the deck and say, let's just see how everyone handles the spring. I would probably do the same. Um, and part of that too, yeah, like like Lathan returning and playing as much as he did, I don't know, probably earned like the, uh, the benefit of the doubt there to, to have a starting spot, but but he is so versatile that it could be anywhere. Like I, I wouldn't let I wouldn't let the fact that Lathan Ransom is, is I guess like returning as the bandit kind of pigeonhole you into only trying to fill the adjuster and the nickel rules. Like if, if you think that Lathan Ransom can move somewhere else and it's almost like the philosophy with offensive line, if, if the position's so interchangeable already, then maybe you just find the best three and then figure out the, where they go af- afterward. And I think the spring allows you to do that. My, my larger question, I think as it pertains to that and linebacker as well with a guy like CJ Hicks is how, how much of Jim Knowles's reticence to rotate on the back end of his defense is just because that's always what he's done at places like Duke and Oklahoma State, where he didn't have the the benefit of the depth of talent to to do more than that, and and maybe last year he wanted to stay in that comfortable lane from him, even if he did have more guys he conceivably could have played. Now now it seems like more urgent that they need to get more players on the field than they did last year. So is that a huge philosophical shift in Jim Knowles' mind? Is that is that a no brainer in Jim Knowles' mind? I, I'm not sure. We didn't get to dig in on that with him. Um, I, I wish we would have, we'll have time to throughout the spring. We'll talk to him multiple times. So, so we'll, we'll get that eventually, but that was also a lingering thing for me is like, wh- how, when you have all this depth of talent available, why not utilize it? I realize you haven't done it before, but now that you can, I feel like you should. Yeah. When you talk about rotation though, is there any spot that we, obviously we talked ad nauseum uh, all through the season about rotation on the defensive line. And now we head into the 2023 spring and there's one defensive end uh, and that's JT two and below. So, uh, who is playing the other side? I mean, and I, we we heard Larry Johnson talk about 
Jack Sawyer and how he thinks he'd prefer to see him there. But with Mitchell Melton still out, with Sawyer playing the, the Jack or the Leo or whatever the hell it's called, like, uh, <laughs> it, does it – Who's playing opposite JT to a Malo out? And if Larry Johnson's philosophy is still never wants to play guys if they're not in there 100 percent fresh, who's playing when JT needs a break? Because it seems to me like there is a a very big issue at defensive end. And uh, Kenyatta Jackson uh, flashed a little bit last year, from what I heard from people. Omari Abor had the knee injury that kept him out for most of the year. Are those guys ready to go and be contributors? Because they have to be this spring. They have to be. They have to be dudes this spring, and if they're not, there's a major problem for Ohio State come fall. That's a that's a great point there, Berm and and Bill. I was thinking about sort of the marriage of those two ideas with the rotation. Like Larry Johnson was doing it far too much, at least for my personal liking. I, I don't think that I'm alone in that regard, but uh, I'll I'll certainly stand by myself if I have to on that hill. But like Jim Knowles was so uh, far in the other direction in the secondary, like. Somebody there needed to be a little bit of compromise. Like Ronnie Hickman was struggling in the second half of the season. That's not a, really for debate. There was no chance that you could make a change with Josh Proctor and like at least see something. We know that they were willing to do that in week one by pulling him out for missing a tackle against Notre Dame. And yeah, that worked out just fine with Lathan Ransom. And then a couple of weeks later, he had one of his best games and then was really never seen again. He's in that mix of six guys. So, you know, do you have to be more flexible if you're Jim Knowles? And do you also have to say, well, maybe uh, maybe it won't be a problem for Larry Johnson this year with, with the numbers that Berm is laying out here on the, at defensive end. And the same is really true at defensive tackle where those numbers are, are definitely not where they probably need to be for Ohio State up front. So how is that going to work? We know that there's really not any issue there at linebacker. Um, and whether that's the semantics about it's a stable position or not from the show last week um, is that another conversation entirely, <laughs> but everything else seems to be, has to be on the table for how you manage the rest of the defense, because it's there's, I don't think that there's clear cut answers for it heading into March. I think, I think, I think the answer could be you like play matchups. And, and I, when I say that, I mean like Sonny Styles didn't really play all year, but then you play a guy like Darnell Washington, you put him on the field and you pull the nickel off the field. The problem is you really only get into that frame of mind when you're Ohio State like four times a year, if that. Yeah. That's on the high end. Um, otherwise, they don't have to worry about matchups. They can kind of play whoever they want, and then it's and then I guess that gets a little more difficult to to kind of allot those snaps. Unless you just say to yourself, "We're gonna we're gonna rotate every other series or first half, second half, whatever." Try to try to feel this out. But um, there's there's not. I, I know like we we say all the time, just like just play everybody. Like it's not that it's not that simple. I I, I try to be sensitive to that, but. Um, they should try. <laughs> they should make an effort to, <laughs> well, to, to get all those guys on the field if they can. I think they want to play everybody, but then you get into these games where it's like you just get into the into a lull, and it's like, well, we got to keep this guy out here. This guy's doing this, so uh, he made one play poorly. So like people just want to hyper react to to one bad play, or they want to over celebrate a good play. Sometimes it seems like it's like secondary rotation back half of the defense it just needs to be like the tsa you know if you see if you see something say something okay <laughs> like if ronnie hickman's not playing well say it and just get him off the field don't play the the politics game and be and be able to move on um i think every unanswered question right now is about the defense like every unanswered question that you have is about the defense because that is what has cost ohio state uh at least one or two more national championship opportunities in the last uh, four years. And until that gets fixed, there is nothing else to talk about other than the defense. But if I'm going to try to like pull an offensive nugget out of this, it'd be how much opportunity is there going to be this spring for Mayan Williams to play? Is he going to get any carries in the spring? Is it going to be all down Hayden because Henderson and Pryor are out? Like, what are they going to do at tailback? Um, is it just chip and, and, and Dallin the whole spring, and he let the other three rest. I mean, it, it seems like a, a weird time for Tony Alford's room. I also think that there is room to ask what it, the wide receiver unit is going to look like with Julian Fleming and Emeka Ibuka on the shelf. We know that they're going to be out there, and the top three are going to be among the best wide receivers in the country by September. So that's not a question for then. But I don't. We got more uh, message board threads and, and questions about last year's class of wide receivers and why they didn't play on the Ohio state.rivals.com uh, message board. Like what happened there? What, what's going on with the development 
of guys like Caleb Burton and Kojo Ansby, like where were they? Well, Xavier Johnson was part of that, but also there has to be, you know, some ownership. The answer is different for all four of those guys. I, I don't, I couldn't, we shouldn't generalize and paint it with the same brush. Some guys have physical development they had to go through. Some had injuries, some had, you know, learn how to practice habits at this level. Like it's not the same for all of them. And it could be a mix in some cases as well, but you know, this is still a pretty significant spring for them because the next wave then is on the way. We know how well uh, Ohio State and Brian Hartline recruited that position. So, you know, if you can't maximize what you learned in year one when you weren't playing at all in this spring where the opportunity is going to be there without two starters practicing with Marvin Harrison not needing to do anything of substance really at all, um, although he'll want to, of course, because of his work ethic. Like this, I don't know how to handicap which of those four is closest uh, other than C.J. Stroud saying that Caleb Burton was more mature in bowl practices than he had been previously throughout last fall. So other than that, I, I don't really know how to say this guy's the closest to maybe helping expand the rotation for Ohio State. Yeah, Caleb Burton was the only one that didn't play. <laughs> so it's like, what is, yeah. what is that? Like, the other three at least got on the field. Yeah, no, I don't know. I, I look at it and I think to myself, even if Emeka Ibuka and Julian Fleming were healthy this spring 100%, rather than having some stuff cleaned up and, and taking some uh, – you know, cautionary measures to miss this spring. Marvin Harrison, the only passes he should catch this season are with the Monarch machine uh, <laughs> in the spring. This spring has to be about those four guys and Jaden Ballard and the three early enroll freshmen. I don't think the other upperclassmen wide receivers should see the field at all in practice. I don't think you risk taking any sort of knee injuries or anything crazy. I think you just keep them, let them do the rehab, let them get healthy, let them work the mental side of the game, let them help teach uh, but then, keep, keep, but then, what does that mean for Kyle McCord and Devin Brown? Because you're also you want to have oh, the you, best evaluation. You got summertime. You got summertime. It's okay. All right. You're okay. talking decisions here. You're talking decision making, not their chemistry with the receivers that are going to catch a thousand yards next year. Like th- this is a spring where Keon Gray's and Caleb Burton and Kojo Antwi, um and, and um, Caleb Brown, Jaden Bauer have to decide who's going to be on this roster by the end of the spring. So because uh, I don't think it's possible that all of them stay on this roster come may so someone's going to have to really emerge and then it's a chance for carnell tate and bryson rogers and noah rogers um to establish themselves as a real viable weapon for ohio state come fall so uh i, I don't think that Emeka buka or marvin harrison or julian fleming or even xavier johnson should be getting any meaningful reps when it comes to like spring football those 15 practices that's just my my vibe i would not put them out there is there a yeah. way where like those guys and the quarterbacks can like work in like a foam pit? So like if they go to the ground, they don't get hurt. If they, like, there's there's nothing, they just like catch the ball and then you land like a big fluffy pile of of foam pillows. <laughs> yeah, like the metaverse. Like they could just work in the metaverse. <laughs> Anti gravity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> something floating through the sky. <laughs> you know those those well, giant I, I really I think it's true that Ohio State has fallen behind in the metaverse. Like, <laughs> it's un- indisputable. <laughs> Well, what if they put him in those knocker ball outfits? You know, those giant uh, fo- rubber balls. Those, those things terrify me. It's yeah, kind of hard to catch footballs with, the, can with they, no yeah, arms. Sir. Can they make those where your hands can come through like you're in a like you're in a lab? You know, you just. <laughs> no, folks, maybe. it's going to be a great week of coverage at the <laughs> podcast. As you can tell, we are ready to roll. Uh, hope this got your Monday started in the right way. We're going to be at Roosters um, at 11 to record. Um, the live show. So if you want to come hang out with us and, and see what appetizer Tuesday is going to be, feel free to do so. It's a great mystery. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't, I actually do know what it is, but wow. I'm not going to look it up. I want the suspense to build mm-hmm. as we get ready. Uh, and then we'll have some more position previews coming in the week ahead. And, uh, and then a, l- a little bit of you'll see for the rest of the coverage on the podcast daily, as we try and get through this slow period for Ohio state football, ahead of spring camp. That's Burn Bill. I am Austin. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.